Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we have the big conversations. Today, we've got somebody who's tackling one of the biggest problems, healthcare, on the program, James Maskell. James, thanks for coming. Hey, great to be here with you, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you never really know where to start these. And we're essentially dealing with the elephant in the room. So healthcare, sick care. What's your story? How did you get into this? Yeah, so I was the weird kid at school that was actually getting healthcare from age zero. I had a chiropractor and uh, I grew up in this community. Um, and, you know, I didn't realize that that was weird until I went to school and realized no one knew what a chiropractor was. I was the only kid in school who the, the nurse at school had to call my mom before I was given antibiotics. And, you know, so I, I, as I got older and I realized like that was not the norm at all. And I, you know, I was the only one who, who uh, thought like that. I started thinking to myself, like, how did my mom with no medical training predict the downside of overuse of antibiotics by 30 years? And as I went forward into my, the rest of my life, that always like was a nagging thing in my mind. Then I had like a rebellious phase where I thought my parents were insane, as every, most people do. And um, I went down the route. I went to university. I did health economics. And I um, ended up getting a job as an investment banker. And about a year into it, I just kind of realized I was playing for the wrong team and decided that I should be involved in healthcare. One of the major reasons seeing is, you know, through my education in health economics, I realized that this was actually the most vexing and complex problem on the planet. But I just had a feeling that something about the way that I was brought up was a solution to it. And I didn't know exactly how or why, but I took a hundred percent pay cut. I moved to America and that was 14 years ago. Did you grow up in a hippie commune? What was it like growing up? Yeah, so I was born into a commune in Loveland, Colorado. Uh, I was about 200 people lived there. I didn't live there for very long because there were satellite communes all around the, the world. And my parents lived in the English and South African ones. So my dad lived in South Africa. My parents at that time were still together. And I would go, you know, mainly in England. At the beginning, I lived in South Africa, but apartheid kind of got a bit wonky in the mid 80s and so we moved to England and then I sort of moved around these communes and then my dad abruptly left this community uh, when I was about 12 or 13 and then I was put into boarding school so I had these like two very distinct um, up until 11 like really in the community and then from 11 to 18 in boarding school and so you know that can uh, create a different life path trajectory. <laughs> what was that transition like? And what was it like having the, your dad leave? Oh man, it was rough. You know, the age is 13 to 15, I think are rough for every human, right? That's like the worst time in all of our lives and throwing in just like a, a big change and not really knowing how to talk about. I can remember definitely being bullied the first time I talked about growing up in a community because I was like the only one and didn't talk about it. I actually was embarrassed about growing up in a community I think until I was about 33. So by this time, I'd, I'm eight years into working in integrative medicine. And I can remember exactly the moment. So I, I, I was in this event space called Deepak Home Base, which is in New York. It's in ABC Home and Carpet. And I walked into that space and I was like, I feel like we're going to do something awesome in this space. It was a beautiful space. And um, I got to meet the woman who curated events there. And I was sitting around with all this like, Deepak paraphernalia and Dalai Lama stuff. And they were really into Thich Nhat Hanh. And I was just like, I'm just going to tell the truth. Like I've been hiding this for a long time. Community has been kind of weird. You know, maybe, maybe this is, maybe this is cool. And I just went for it. So I met this woman there. Her name's Paula Gilovich. She's a dear friend to this day. And I just decided I was going to tell her the truth about where I came from, where I was born. And at the end of that conversation, she, she said, I'll do anything I can to help you. That's amazing. And I was just like, holy shit, maybe community is cool now. And, you know, that's been, that was sort of like a, a transformational moment in my story where almost from that moment, I was in kind of a flow state where the right people and the right things just started happening. And, and the journey that we've been on in the last uh, six years has really been amazing. And, you know, we're just getting started. I want to get into that, but You've referred to it a couple times, community, not commune. And I'm curious what it was like growing up there. And, and is that just a branding thing? Or how do you think about that time and that experience? 
Well, look, I've, I've had a lot of different ways to, to think about it um, over time. The one thing that I, I took from it, the one thing I realized when I was about 20 was that I was good at talking to people who weren't my own age. And I, I, that was a reflection. Like growing up, it was amazing. There was a lot of kids around. You know, my parents were kind of like leaders in a certain way. So I was kind of like the only child. And so I think people were just nice to me because of my, again, a quote unquote position. So I was like, I had a great childhood. It was amazing. Have a lot of other kids around. I didn't really realize that it was abnormal because I was just living in these, you know, in these communities um, in different places. Some of my oldest friends, like in the South Africa community, the four old, you know, the four closest friends I have in my life all grew up there. We're all the same age. Four parents all decided to have kids at the same time. We're all born within, you know, three months of each other. And so, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. But the things that I, on, in reflection, I realized that most people, when I got to university, like other kids my age had never really had conversations with adults who weren't their parents or like their parents friends and I had been kind of forced to interact with the people of a range of ages super old people people my parents age other kids you know who are different ages so even though I was an only child I feel like I was like very well adjusted to you know communicating with other people and um, that was a positive reflection I had on it you know there was definitely some like wacky community stuff i mean you guys have seen probably uh the osho documentary um wild wild country you know the community that we were in was probably not quite as fun as that i don't think there was as much uh as much fun happening but you know there was certainly some parallels right there's 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 things that probably in retrospect weren't that cool you know it was that it was born of like the 50s culture where you had sort of like a big sort of patriarchy hangover um, in the sort of the, the structure of it. So women were kind of not, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a center for female empowerment, put it that way. And so like, yeah, there was some wonky stuff about it. And that's part of the reason why my dad left, honestly. And he just realized it wasn't what he had sort of signed up for 25 years earlier. And um, that was sort of the beginning of my transition into like normal society, quote, quote unquote, and uh, you know, some interesting times. And being normal while also not being normal. Eastern, Western medicine. When did this strange obsession or passion of yours come about? How did you get into healthcare specifically or keeping yeah, people so, healthy? Yeah, it developed over time. So, you know, I never had, I never went to a regular doctor. I had a homeopath, I had a chiropractor. Um, I didn't realize that was abnormal until, you know, until I started to realize what normal medicine was or Western medicine. Um, you know, I, I just kept abreast of, of, you know, part of what that community was involved with was healthcare. Like the, that community that I grew up in was involved in the very beginnings of the integrated medicine movement. The first MDs that were getting interested in, in integrated medicine were getting trained. And, you know, all that, that community, a lot of them were standard process reps. Standard process was the first supplement company that was only sold through doctors. And so I was like really involved in, in, that, in that world kind of by proxy. Um, the passion didn't come straight away. When I moved to America, I moved really on a wing and a prayer. I didn't really know what I was getting into. My cousin um, who I went to work for had been involved in the spa industry. He'd been very successful. Um, he'd grown a, a nat the first natural skincare line that came into America called Jolique. He had brought that here in 1992. Um, I had worked for him. I still, you know, he, um, built that into a $50 million business. So I, I knew that he knew what he was doing. And I really realized I wanted to be an entrepreneur. But my first job that they put me in when I moved to America is I worked in their concept for what they thought the future of medicine was going to be, which was basically integrated medicine delivered in a spa environment. They knew how to run day spas. They were sort of 10 years ahead of the integrated medicine movement in understanding how to run a cash-based business. And I started working in that clinic that we had a naturopathic doctor that was like the head clinician. And I saw chronic disease reversal. I saw people reversing chronic illness, right? Lupus and, and you know, type 2 diabetes and heart disease and, you know, and, and other types of things. And I just realized like, no one knows about this. This was 2005, right? This is not normal. People don't understand that this is possible. And ultimately it started to fit into what in, now I can look back as sort of like the life thesis, which is 
what structures and systems create a model where the default, where the, the end result of the model is health and constrained cost. Because from health economics, I could see that America was going to go off a massive cliff because the cost was so high and the outcomes were so low. And so, you know, the, the mission was, can we work out what it takes to be able to build a health system that keeps people healthy and constrains cost? And a big part of that has to be getting people to a point of homeostasis where they're not on a lifetime dependence of drugs because drugs are expensive and only getting more expensive. And so that was like the first piece in the puzzle. And that was sort of like for the next 10 years was like a real obsession, which was really understanding how this works. How could you reverse a chronic illness? How could you get people off medication? And then, you know, in the last five years, how could you really scale the delivery of that kind of care up to every American? And so that's been like the journey for the, for, that, for the last 10 years. And then, you know, what we're moving into next is sort of understanding like larger incentives and other things that uh, keep people healthy or keep people spending a lot on health. And uh, that's where we are now. I would argue that's where the big problem is, is the incentive model that's built into healthcare right now, especially in the U.S. In, in most places, it's based off of a what can you build, that's what you get paid for type of deal. But how do, we, how do we change something like this when you have, I mean, healthcare is what, 20, 30% of the US GDP at this point? Yeah, 20%. Yeah, look, it's a big deal. Um, ultimately, it's going to change to, you know, some radical shifts. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, yeah, there's a lot. But, you know, I mean, I'm an economist, right? 20% of GDP being essentially used to keep the working population healthy. I mean, that's kind of what that money is going towards. Like, it's a pretty inefficient use of resources. If, if we could halve that or even less, like Japan, it's 6% of GDP that goes towards healthcare. They've got the best health, health outcomes in the world, the best infant mortality, right? The best longevity, right? And they only use 6%. So if we just use 6% and we were able to turn the ship around, what could that 14% of our resources, of our time, of our effort be used? Like what would the human race be, be capable of? What would America be capable of if those resources were being allocated towards, you know, taking, taking the world forward? So, you know, I think it's a big problem, but ultimately, you know, we are running out of money. And I just want to say, you know, even though the incentive structure is very different in different countries, the core problem is still the same which is that everyone's running out of money, right? The kind of diseases that we have have transformed dramatically. Um, you know, in America, it took about 50 years to go from a time where the most leading causes of death were acute infectious illnesses to a point where the leading causes of death were chronic lifestyle-driven illnesses. That took half a century. In South Africa, where my dad lives, that same shift took 10 years from tuberculosis to type 2 diabetes in 10 years. So all around the world, as, as, these, um, as countries industrialize, the shift of the burden of, of disease shifts from a model where there's a single cause and a single cure to a model where there's a complex cause and a complex cure. And so ultimately, systems are going to have to adopt this new model of medicine because it's designed for that type of care. And so ultimately, you know, that's, that's what we're in the process of, of trying to transition. Incentives are a big problem. They're a problem for providers, but they're also a problem for, um, for consumers of healthcare. And, and, it, and it's different in different systems. It's different in the UK where we have like a single payer system. We're different in the US where we have this kind of hodgepodge of employer and health insurance um, and, and government care. But ultimately, the core problem is still the same. We are running out of money to deliver healthcare because we have too many people that have too many chronic illnesses that are going on too long that require too much medication and too much care and the cost is unsurmountable. And so ultimately, this is an elegant solution to all of those things and it has to happen. Um, it's an evolution. It's, it's, it's the way that medicine is going to have to adapt to these issues. And that's why I called my book and my company, The Evolution of Medicine, because this is just the future, whether we like it or not. Basically, it's prevention versus reversal because reversal is way more expensive. Yeah, 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 exactly. Prevention is a big thing. But even greater than that, 
you know, prevention is still a concept based in a system based on risk and fear. And ultimately what I'm advocating for is a system based on, you know, uh, love and community and connection and health creation, right? It's, it's, it's a subtle distinction. Like it's very difficult to quantify to prevent a disease that you never know that you're, whether you're going to get. And ultimately what I think is the future is a system that's built around not disease risk markers, but actually about health creation markers, markers like resilience, um, where you can like how, how many, you know, how much, how much stress can the body take? Um, how resilient are you to disease? Those are the markers that I think are interesting. We're not quite there. That's probably still five years away from really understanding uh, those kind of concepts, but that's kind of the direction that we're going. But a good proxy to understand what I'm talking about is definitely prevention. Um, you know, there's definitely a shift away from the medicine for the average to the medicine for the individual. And, you know, community is really my focus all the way through all the businesses that we've built. Community is the focus because community is really like a, a very elegant solution to, um, you know, to the problems that we're facing. And, and the, the, the inclusion of community into medicine is, I think, the most elegant, elegant solution uh, for these issues. And it's the one constant in the blue zones. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, so I, I started, you know, as so, I mean, what order we could go in, but ultimately, you know, I saw that, that uh, integrative functional medicine was an operating system for creating health. And I think the blue zones are an incredible example because for those of your listeners who aren't familiar, blue zones are five places around the world where people live to a hundred without chronic disease, right? They have way lower levels of chronic disease than the Western world. And when they were studied, yes, community is a big thing that goes all across them. But ultimately, when you look at those areas, the one thing you notice straight away, there's no epic hospitals, right? It's not like more medicine has created this, this health. A community, um, a culture of health, uh, a, a culture where healthy behaviors are built into the culture. And that could just be like evolutionarily, like in Costa Rica, where, you know, on the Nicoya Peninsula, it's, it's, you know, you got a healthy environment, or it could be like the seventh day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, where they fast regularly, you know, they eat a healthy diet. I mean, Loma Linda is pretty disgusting. If you've ever been there, it's in the LA bowl. The, you know, the quality of the air is not great, but yet these people are living to hundred without chronic disease. So, you know, that to me is more of an example. So it's about creating, you know, culture, a culture where health is default, where health creation is default, where behaviors that are embraced by the culture create health for the long term. And so that's, that's kind of the direction we want to go. Basically, if you want to lose weight, don't keep junk food in your house because it makes you more likely to fail. If you want to be healthy, set yourself up for health by making yeah. the systems in place. How do we do that? Yeah. So, you know, ultimately, you know, we need to create cultures where behavior, where healthy behaviors are the norm. And, you know, we, I started thinking about this in terms of the doctor's office, because that's where medicine is delivered right now. Ultimately, the solution for this is not doctor based. But to give you an example of where I think, you know, to give you your, your listeners an example of where this disruption is going to occur. So in January, my second book is coming out and it's all on this idea of medical group visits, right? So what I've seen over the last five years, and I've been documenting it, I've been uh, doing a whole podcast series with people running this, is that changing behaviors is about creating an, the right environment. Just like you said, right? Don't have the junk food in the house. But more than that, how do you sustain healthy behaviors? And the only way to sustain healthy behaviors is when you have a supportive community that also think like that. That could be your church group, right? Church played that role for a lot of people. Um, you know, historically, there might be other structures that you have, but we're seeing a breakdown of that. So, you know, group medical visits are a way that uh, people have been able to take people who by and large have unhealthy behaviors and are lonely, right? Loneliness is a bigger risk factor for chronic illness than what you eat, whether you smoke, whether you exercise. So, you know, imagine most people, 
because of the technological revolution, most people are both lonely and in an unhealthy environment. And so group medical visits creates a way that you can introduce people who want to be healthy to each other and create new bonds around health creation. And so as an example, they're using this at the Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, super exciting innovation in the future of healthcare, um, run by Dr. Mark Hyman or led by Dr. Mark Hyman. So, you know, he was getting very popular. People wanted to come to the Cleveland Clinic to see him and his team of doctors doing functional medicine in a very like one-on-one -on -one way, just the way it's always been personalized, precision medicine. And guess what? The, des the demand was going up rapidly, but the supply was only going up, you know, in a, in a small way. So the, the waiting list was getting bigger and bigger. So one of the administrators there called Tawny Jones, and I had her on my podcast. She's amazing. She's like an administrator for the Cleveland Clinic. She decided to start this group visit model called Functioning for Life. So before you get to see Mark Hyman, you have to go through a 10 week, two hours a week, paid on insurance, run by physicians assistants and health coaches group visit model where they teach you basically how to run your body how to like be healthy how to how to do that and introduce you to other people in your community who also want that guess what 66 percent of people at the end of that 10 weeks don't need to see the doctor because they're healthy and it's because if you put healthy behaviors and you add them in to a community framework you have a transformational health outcome. And it's affordable, it's available on insurance, it make, makes behavior change easy, it's accessible. So, you know, that's, that's a model that fuses functional medicine and community. And that's ultimately, you know, the example that I think is available inside medicine to show these principles coming together in, a, in, a, in an elegant way. Is the problem that we're evolved to be lazy and we want the easy solution, the silver bullet? And traditionally, healthcare pharma has told us, take this pill, it's the silver bullet. Yeah, look, there's a, there's a century long indoctrination into what healthcare is, what medicine is, and what medicine should be. But you know, it's, 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 also, it's also just old thinking being applied to different issues and let me unpack that a little bit so you know if you have an infection taking an antibiotic is a great solution right before we had people would die of a you know of a small cut and so you know and so people and so because it would get infected and we had no plan to deal with it right as soon as antibiotics come along we change the trajectory of of life expectancy and there's now this incredible scientific breakthrough that leads to something that we didn't think possible. And that gets romanticized for good reason. It's amazing. But ultimately, you know, the diseases that we have today aren't like that. Like type two diabetes isn't a single cause, single cure issue. Some people get type two diabetes because they're eating the wrong food the whole time. Some people get it because their insulin sensitivity is impacted by toxic exposure. Some people get it through chronic stress affects their insulin sensitivity. So there's, there's all kinds of reasons why this happens. So we have a fundamentally different kind of disease. It needs a different kind of intervention. It's not, you know, we were, we were hardwired to think that we want the silver bullet, but only because the silver bullets were pretty awesome. For a period of time there, it looked like we might be able to solve every disease with a silver bullet, then we had the human genome and we mapped it and we realized, oh, there isn't really a gene for type 2 diabetes, an environmental thing, and we had to rethink it. But this is the future. The future is understanding, dealing with the cause, right? A root cause approach. If, you know, if your diet caused your type 2 diabetes, your diet, a change in diet can reverse it. And that's, that's, uh, that's a new way of thinking in medicine. But I predict that in 10 years, we will just be indoctrinated to this in the same way that we were indoctrinated to antibiotics. And people will think, why did we ever just, you know, go and try and turn off the symptoms? Why didn't we look for the cause? It'll be the same embedded thinking in the way that we have now with, um, you know, antibiotics in the way. It just takes a while for people to understand the concept, but it's growing rapidly. It's, it's very intuitive. And so I think it's catching on quickly and more and more quickly. Based on your understanding, are, is more or less chronic disease 
caused or triggered by more triggered by inflammation. So that's the epigenetic marker that creates or activates XYZ chronic disease, chronic condition. I mean, it's, it's, it's either a cause or an effect, but it's definitely there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where there's a lot of causes of inflammation, but if we figure out what we're doing, do you, do you get worried at all? I see a lot of scientists focused on longevity, trying to come up with not necessarily a health-based solution, but trying to come up with a vacuum cleaner solution that fixes the problem after it starts versus addressing, addressing the cause. So drinking Coca-Cola while taking a pill so that the sugar doesn't affect my hips. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more money in that. There, there <laughs> that is pill that you take with the Coke. I mean, I mean, look, that's part of what's happened is science is broken. Science is really broken, right? You know, I, I know scientists and, and trying to get public money to do research is really hard. Getting private money to do research is really easy. And so, you know, if you want to continue to be a scientist, because that's what you train for your whole life, and you don't really know where your next paycheck is coming from, if you're no longer a scientist, and you don't have a grant, going after private money is the way to continue your career. It's a reasonable thing for a scientist to do. The problem is, it means that we spend, up, spend all the dollars on that pill that goes with the Coke, and not, you know, lifestyle things that, that are, you know, are in the public good, but, you know, public funding for science is, is through the floor, pretty much across the board. And so that's, you know, that's a, that's a big cause of, of what you're just sharing there. So I want to, I want to transition. We're talking money a little bit, yeah. health insurance. Hey God, it's, yeah. it's God, it's broken, but talk to me about health insurance, health sharing, and then yeah. what you guys are working on. Yeah. So the last 10 years I've been really involved in trying to scale up the delivery of the right kind of medicine to reduce, revert chronic illness. And so that's one project It's called the evolution of medicine and we're involved with that. So then a, a couple of years ago or really six years ago, I came face to face with American health insurance, right? I never actually had health insurance. The first 10 years I lived in America for different reasons. I was an entrepreneur. I was, you know, um, young and foolhardy or whatever. In retrospect, I saved a ton of money by not having it because I didn't use it. I had a lot of doctor friends, but yeah, I came face to face with health insurance because I had a daughter. So I'm living in New York, um, you know, having a daughter. My mother-in-law is like, you gotta get health insurance, you're having a kid. So I'm like, okay, so I start looking into it and it's not only stupidly expensive, but secondly, none of the doctors that I wanna see take my, would take that insurance. And so I'm, I'm sort of sitting there going, what, what am I doing? Like, what am I paying for? Like, if I buy this and I'm taking care of my own health, you know, what, 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 what's this point, point for? And, and with high deductibles and all these kind of things, it just really made no sense to me. And I started looking for a different solution. And uh, a friend of mine put me onto this thing, and maybe your listeners will have heard of it, depending on where they come from. It's the most American concept ever. It's called a Christian health cost sharing ministry. And, you know, the history of it is that there's a couple of ways to defer the risk of something really bad happening to you like a car accident, right? Either you have to get into an agreement with an insurance company, which is a third party profit making enterprise who will, for a premium that you pay every month, insure your risk for a certain set of circumstances. So that's the way that it's one be done. But in the 80s, a few church groups realized, hey, why, if 15,000 of our, if 10,000 of our church population are all paying Blue Cross Blue Shield to be our insurance provider, what if we just decided to all leave insurance together and come up with our own community-based agreement? That if Dan gets hit by a car and that, the cost of that car accident is 10 grand, we'll all just send him a dollar. How about that? And they do it. And guess what? It's awesome. I mean, it works, right? First of all, they have the most efficient person, a lawyer probably in the community, negotiate every rate for every health thing that anyone in the community has. So they're negotiating down the rates because the 80s is the beginning of this like shift towards profit making in healthcare, started in the 70s with Nixon. But ultimately you start seeing, you know, this range of prices for the same service, depending on what insurance you have. So people start to realize like, this is kind of like a scam, you know, paying different rates. I always want to play only the lowest rate. 
How do you only ever pay the lowest rate? You pay cash, right? So they work out this system where instead of a company uh, organizing the risk, the community is bearing the risk. And so in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, these things kind of started to grow and there's different names for them. And some were like, you had to be in the city and you had to have a letter from the pastor. Some were like very aggressively Christian and some were just like, hey, you could be any denomination of Christianity. You just have to like follow by these rules. So in 2010, there was 160,000 Americans that used this out of 350 million. So very, very few. Um, but then something amazing happened, which is that Obamacare came along and these Christian groups were given an exemption to the Affordable Care Act individual mandate. So the central focus of, of, of the ACA was essentially giving everyone a tax penalty if they didn't get health insurance. And ultimately, you could avoid that tax penalty by having being part of one of these Christian ministries. So in 2013, when my daughter was born, I signed up for one. And instead of my monthly payment being around $1,500, it was $449. So I was saving $1,100 a month, right? And, you know, I like acupuncture. I go to a chiropractor. My daughter's pediatrician is the best pediatrician in New York. I love him. He's amazing, but he doesn't take insurance. So like, you know, I could pay out of that money that I was saving, I could pay, you know, pay him directly. So that worked out very well for me. And I started to think, I bet there's a lot of other healthy people in the country who don't know about this, who it might work out for them. So in 2015, we actually worked with that Christian ministry to create our own product with them. It was okay. You know, we got a lot of people signed up, but we weren't really in control of it. We were just like a sales agent. And, and also there were, there were some things I really liked about it, right? One, no one's paying the high price for any of the services and the gap between cash and high insurance prices going up so much so that like I interviewed someone on my podcast the other day who through working with one of these ministries was able to get their cost for an appendectomy down from $132,000 to $12,000 saving $120,000 on that thing. So, you know, first of all, I love that part of it, but if you're going to control costs, right? You can't pay $132,000 for an appendectomy. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the energy is different, even though they're very similar in concept. You pay in a certain amount every month. If something bad happens, you get money back from the pool, you know, minus a kind of a deductible-like thing. They're very similar like that. But the energy is different, Matt. And the energy is different because it's like, in, in, in insurance, it's this other company. It's like, oh, Aetna. I'm paying this company, Aetna, that's profit-making. I can see how much profit they're making in the stock exchange every day. These guys don't care about me. These guys are incentivized to not pay out for what I need. And so I'm just going to try and you know, get my money's worth. And here's where the incentives get wonky, is that the people who get the best value from their health insurance plan are sick right? The sicker you are, the more stuff you get for your premium, the better value you're getting from your plan, the more medicine you get. And that incentivizes costs to go up and usage to go up and all these kind of things. In the Christian ministry, I started to feel like I was a, you know, I was, I was part of a community and that I was, I was partly responsible for the funds of that community. And I was, I was, I was taking the idea of personal responsibility, which is, uh, which is what it means to sort of operate in the integrative functional medicine world. And I was now participating in community responsibility. And for me, that was the thing that got me where I was like, this is it, right? This is the future. This is the way, this is the tweak to insurance. That is the way that it should be. I realized that you know, and then the other thing that I didn't like about it, it was very old school, like people literally sending checks in the mail or sending dollars in the mail, right? Which is not scalable. And also they weren't taking best use of what I could see was this integrative and functional medicine revolution where we could actually, you know, keep people well and get people well. So I thought to myself, if ever there was a time where we could start our own health cost sharing community, where we could make integrative and functional medicine the standard of care, and where we could sort of decouple it from Christendom, not that Christians wouldn't be able to come, but that like my Jewish friends who were healthy would be in, and my Muslim friends who I play cricket with would be able to be in. And like every, it would be like, you know, the, the religion would be health, 
right? The religion would be, we believe in health, we take care of our own health, and we, we, we want to be part of a community that does too, that we should take that opportunity. And in January 2018, the law changed, and that's when we started New Health. And it's been a year and a half. It's been an awesome journey so far. We're just getting started. But we're going to try and build something that not only contains cost and keeps people healthy, but more importantly, gives incentives to the rest of society to do the same. Are you guys nonprofit? And how do you deal with different localities? So we're available in all 50 states. Um, we're not a nonprofit. You know, we want to scale this up. You know, this is not just a solution for America. This is a solution for the 4 billion people around the world who are currently uninsured and there's no social net. Um, so yeah, we want to scale this up. We get a need, probably invest the money to move and grow it. So it's a for-profit entity. Um, but ultimately, yeah, we're in the, in the very beginning of, I hope what will be my life's work to be able to create structures that control cost and keep people healthy. How do you avoid, I imagine that's what insurance companies initially thought. How do you avoid that? They, they were probably good people before they became bad people. Yeah, look, we'll see. I mean, I ultimately, I think it's about creating an ethos in the company that, you know, that, that uh, does the right thing. And it's about creating the right incentives down the road. I mean, I think, I think commerce is the great, has the greatest potential to transform and shape society. Um, but it has to, you know, it has to be done in an ethos. And I think that today, the greatest way to share a new ethos in the world is to, you know, is to, to build a company, you know, certain companies like that, right. Uh, health insurance, it's old and then it comes through and it becomes a um, publicly traded company. And then it, you know, has to serve shareholders first because that's what public companies have to do. But, you know, look at a more, more relevant example would be something like Airbnb where, you know, it's a sharing economy. We're just bringing the sharing economy into medicine. We're sharing the cost of, of health expenditures and ultimately what it takes to be able to maintain that is, um, you know, is, is, is leadership and structures and setup. I don't really know. I'm just getting into it. Like I'm, I'm doing my thing right now and I hope to learn from those people who have made mistakes. I hope to learn from those people who have done it right. There are more and more examples every day of people using companies for positive change. And um, I hope that we can, you know, hope that we can be that. So I'm an entrepreneur. My wife's an entrepreneur. The U S healthcare system is set up where if you're not an employee, you're kind of screwed when it comes to healthcare, Obamacare going away or somehow fighting and trying to see what's going to happen. If yep. that, go if that goes away without something like what you guys are doing, we essentially have to leave the country because it's like playing Russian roulette. You put a bullet or two in the gun and you spin it next to your head with the costs here. What, a, what is what you guys are doing? How does that functionally work? Let's say I or someone listening wanted to sign up. Yeah, so you know, if, let's say you're a family. The average cost of health insurance for a family um, without you know, being an employee, if you're buying your own health insurance, so if you are an entrepreneur, we work for yourself, or you get fired from your job and you just have to do it, it's about $2,000 a month right now and going up pretty rapidly. You know, compare that to new health for that same family for yourself, you know, your age is going to be about five or $600 a month. So, you know, you're saving, saving a significant amount of money right there. One of the best feelings that I ever have is hearing from members who sign up who are like, I was able to quit my job that I hate because I found that found you. They've been so scared of quitting because they were like, if I quit, I can't afford $2,000 a month for health insurance. And you know, it's the nut is too big for me to start my own thing and move in my own direction. So yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a practical amount of savings that you're having there. Ultimately it's not exactly the same as having health insurance, you know, but ultimately, you know, the, the, the healthiest people in the world don't go to the doctor all the time, right? That's something we have to get out of the head out of. Like, yes, I believe in, you know, mar you know, test your biomarkers, see what your inflammation level is, see what your hemoglobin A1C is, you know, see those levels. But ultimately our vision is that you shouldn't have, you know, you, it's not really reasonable, I don't think, to have a prescriber be the first port of call for every issue in medicine because their default is the prescription path. You know, that's why we take use of health coaches. That's why we make, you know, um, 
the uh, health uh, testing, lab testing. If you live in 47 states in the country, we have the lowest cost for you to go and do a lab panel that if you went through the doctor would be $3,000, would be $100 with us because that's the depth of the scam that we're living in. So ultimately, you know, we're just trying to create a structure where empowered people can come and take care of their own health. If they love their doctor, they can get into their own relationship with them. We're seeing the rise of things like direct primary care, where you can pay a monthly fee to your chosen doctor to be for them to be your doctor. But for $100 a month, you know, you're saving $1,400 a month over a health insurance, an extra 100 to have your own doctor that you love if you wanna go in that way too. I don't have a doctor. I know a lot of doctors. If I have a specific condition, I'll go specifically to a doctor who can help me. But if you look at the data, we've passed in America the point of diminishing marginal returns for every bit more medicine. Why are we the first country in the world where, you know, where, where life expectancy has gone down for the last three years gone down? That is historically, it's never happened. Why has it happened? Well, it's only happened with a war. You know, we've got the equivalent of 10 Vietnam wars happening simultaneously in America. People are dying from opiates, right? That's prescribed by a physician. You don't want to be in a position where you're going to get into that loop, right? So work with a naturopath, work with a you know, nutritionist, work with a health coach, work with a functional medicine doctor whose goal is to get you healthy and off medication. That has to be the front lines of healthcare in my opinion. What's it look like? You get hit by a car, you find out you have cancer. How does it work in terms of big payments? I know you, you go to the emergency room and then they're like, here you go, you were here for two hours. Here's the $25,000 bill. Yeah, so look, first of all, you have someone on your team who can negotiate every bill for you, right? So you break your arm, right? You call up and you say, hey, I broke my arm. This happened to actually my brother-in-law. He, he, he used to work for me. He was on our plan, so I'll tell him what he did. He calls up. He's like, hey, I just broke my arm skiing. And they're like, okay, where are you? I'm on this mountain. Okay, we've looked at our thing. We've got 20 years of experience of doing this because the company that we're partnered with does this for all the Christian ministries. Two miles away from you is the emergency room, and we've already called them. We've negotiated the price uh, for you. Go there. We'll negotiate the price. You pay the price. So you go down there you know, that arm break and getting the plaster set and everything, that would have cost 40 grand if you're just given your insurance card. That's what they would have charged your insurance, but he gets it for five grand. So he pays five grand, he submits that bill to us. He had a 500 unshared amount, so he gets a check back for 4,500 within 30 days. So ultimately, he has to outlay the five grand because we're, we're a community of uh, self-insured patients. We're a community of, you know, self-funded patients where we pay for our own care. You pay the five grand, you submit that in, you get $4,500 back. So that's the structure. You know, it's not insurance, but it's reassurance in the, in the, in the case of, of an, urge, an, an accident or something like that. Is there a limit? No limit. Some of those Christian ones had a limit of 250,000 or a million. We created ours with no limit. It's, it's very, very interesting because it's not a hypothetical in terms of us having to leave the country solely because of healthcare. And I think a lot of people are in a similar boat. It's something like millennials will be spending a quarter to upwards of half of their lifetime salary on healthcare if we continue down this path. Join the, join the resistance, my friend, and get all of your cool listener friends to do it too. I mean, this is it. Look, and then once we get to 5,000 members, 10,000 members, whatever. How many do you have right now? Can you look say? at all the cool stuff. We've got a couple thousand right now. Um, you know, we've partnered with a group where we're sharing in the risk pool of more like 30,000. So there's 30,000 in our risk pool. But once we get to 5,000, we can decouple from that risk pool and chart our own journey forward. And ultimately, this is a community. And, you know, the, the vision that I have for it, and actually the answer to your other question how do you keep this from going haywire like insurance did or where the incentives happen is because technology is emerging now where you could actually have a community that makes decisions for itself. Look at the blockchain revolution, right? Embedded in blockchain is this idea of consensus where the community decides how things move along. 
And ultimately, what I see for this is communities of people deciding for themselves what their health cost sharing community does. And ultimately, that's the vision for it. So if this thing goes bust and you know, doesn't fulfill its potential, it won't be my fault. It'll be because we haven't been able to create a structure where people could come to an agreement about where things want to go. And so ultimately, we just have to get this thing off the ground. Once we get to a point where we have our own autonomy, my vision is to create structures where the community itself decides where it's going and, you know, and what its journey is. And that's, that's, that's what I think is possible. And that was not really possible before these kind of technologies came along where um, communities of people could self-determine their future. What do you think about the future and the role of wearables, genetic testing, et cetera, bi- microbiome testing when it comes to health? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm pretty bullish generally on personalization of medicine. Um, I think that, you know, we're very much, you know, anyone who's, who's changing their diet, supplements, lifestyle based on the current state of genetic or microbiome testing is probably a biohacker rather than someone who's like doing a reasonable thing. We don't really know enough, especially about the microbiome. No one even knows what a healthy microbiome is, never mind, you know, what to do to get it there. So all of the stuff that you're seeing on that right now is very early, but in general, I'm bullish on that concept. I just think, you know, it's going to take a little while to mature. Um, but, you know, I'm generally, I think personalization is, is the future. I think we're, we're moving towards an era. My, my mentor, Dr. Jeff Bland, talks about an era of precision public health. And I love that idea. It's like, how do you create a healthy public that each individual inside that community is healthy? That it would have been a pipe dream even today, but is, is moving in a way that um, is going to make it possible for most people. You said other, one other thing that I can't remember that you wanted me to comment on. Not microbiome testing. Genetics, wearables, wearables, all of the data that comes with it. Yeah, wearables is interesting. I mean, what's your experience with wearables? My experience is that I wear a wearable, I get an insight, and then I'm then the wearable loses its value, and I don't need to wear it anymore. Um, that's my experience. But maybe they'll become more sophisticated in the future. I do think it's great for having insight. Let me give you an example. So I got an aura ring last year, and I wore it when we did this tour. And what I learned from that was that I always assumed that I slept well. Why did I assume that? Because when I got into bed, when I decided it was time to go to sleep, I fell asleep. And then I wouldn't wake up until the morning and then I'd wake up. So I was like, oh, I must be a great sleeper, lucky me. And so I would do things that people would tell me were not healthy, like look at my phone before bed. Because you know what? As soon as I turn over, I'm gonna go to sleep and it's fine. What I found through wearing the aura ring was that actually, even though I was going to sleep well and waking up well, my level of deep sleep was super low. In some cases, like one or 2%. And, and then so I realized, like, oh, then I tried, okay, I'm not gonna look at my phone before I go to bed. And then my deep sleep percentage went up. So in that moment, I had a realization, which is that, you know, your own perceptions of how well you're sleeping are not actually the full perception. And so now I have a better idea and it led to a healthy behavior change. But now I don't wear the aura ring all the time. So I think it's valuable, but I also think they probably have a limited, limited use. So maybe in our health cost sharing cooperative, you know, once you're done with your aura ring, you could pass it on to someone with the same finger size. I think that's part of it, but I think there's also the future where you have more continuous blue, uh, blood glucose monitoring. Yeah. I'd love super, to- I love that one. I mean, I, I'm very excited. I mean, people who have done that tell me they learned more about themselves in like a day than anything that they've ever done. So I'm very bullish on that. I would love to see smart toilets as well. <laughs> Matt, you better cut back on XYZ. Or yeah. your, your biome's a little off, buddy. You're about to blow. Yeah, I think there are some really interesting aspects. I think we're still a little ways off from having those consumer priced and ubiquitous, but I think we will get there. The, the data around it is a little bit terrifying. Who owns it? Can we keep it secure? Yeah. That's definitely, you know, the next five years is going to be a very interesting time. I think we're just really working out now how much data other people hold from us and and how valuable that is. Um, So yeah, that is, it is scary for sure. Yeah. We're all caught with our pants down and soon that will be the truth in of itself. I want to, I want to jump into the lightning round. This is a couple of bonus uh, patron only questions. Sound good? Yep. First question. The flip side what technology or trend are you most excited about and why? 
Well, I mentioned it earlier, like I really feel like blockchain is exciting. You know, everyone got very excited about the like uh, financial implications. Obviously, you've got Facebook launching its own currency. Like it's going mainstream. People are going to know there's going to be other currencies outside of what we have right now. Um, but outside of the currency application, what I'm really interested in is the um, transparency, I think is very interesting for it. But I, where I'm interested in it for healthcare and for my health cost sharing community is communities of people being able to make their own decisions and the, the creation of consensus without leadership. And I wanna just share, there's a thing in the human body. You've talked a lot about the gut microbiome today. How does the gut microbiome make decisions? Right? It makes it through this concept called quorum sensing, where when the gut microbes get in touch with a certain substance, they elicit there's certain chemicals that come out. When those chemicals get to a certain um, frequency or a certain uh, concentration, it, it causes a change in the behavior of those microbes and they act as one. So this is leaderless communication and leaderless coordination of, of um, decentralized decision making. And that's called quorum sensing. And that is a concept that's built into blockchain um, consensus building. And so I think that, you know, communities of people making decisions for themselves without leadership and all the corruption that happens when you have that kind of leadership structure, I think is super interesting. And um, I hope to be able to pioneer something awesome with it. Yeah, it's like a neural net. Yeah. Speaking of community and community decision making, have you ever thought about moving back to a commune or creating one that was a little bit more in line with your ideals? Watch this space. I'm actually in the process of, uh, of on the cross section of regenerative agriculture and community is probably something that might be my next project. Very cool. You could have your own little CrossFit cult of healthy, happy people. Sounds good. Yeah, you in? Come join. We've I, got the best I, health insurance. I would definitely think about it. It's there's so many things that there's so many things that are broken with the world, and so many people trying to fix them. But I think yeah. a big part of the problem is just not being around the right people. Being around the right people makes a lot, if not all, of the difference. Yeah, I think one of the things too is is reporting back on the successes and failures of of experiments. You know, I think that there's a lot of people experimenting in community. I'd like to hear how it's going, like what worked, what didn't. Um, so I'd like to be, if there was a, a way of coordinating the efforts of different people, um, you know, trying things and experimenting, I think that would be, would be very helpful for the acceleration too. If you've, got a, if you've got a detailed pitch on what that looks like, I'm interviewing AJ Jacobs, the self-experimenter guy in two and a half hours. He's a... He takes it basically a year to write the, some incredible book, The Year of Living Biblically, where he literally lived out all of the rules of the Bible. He, he, he's done some pretty interesting stuff, but maybe you could get him on board for the year Sounds of good. communal living. Yeah, that would be great. Where can people find you, learn more about you and what you do? Yeah, so um, newhealth.com, that's new with a K, K-N-E-W, health.com. That's the medical cost sharing uh, my website is jamesmaskell.com. Um, if you're a practitioner or health professional, you can join our functional forum meetup groups. You can watch 68 episodes of the show that we made first Monday of every month for five years called the Functional Forum. Why 68? Um, Why not go for the funny 69? Because that's next month. We're still going. <laughs> I like it. Very good answer. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on today. It's been Bye -bye. enlightening and hopefully people look into it. I need to look into it more as well. This is something where I heard you on another podcast. I wanted to learn more, potentially just from the own personal self-satisfying, let's do this and screw Blue Cross type benefits, but we will, uh, we will see. All right. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And if you guys have enjoyed this, check out James' work, share this episode around with a friend, and consider leaving a review, disruptors.fm slash iTunes. Thanks, guys, and cheers.